Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Saturday morning show. Selling to your tenant is what we're talking about today, uh, Jim, and really everything you know to kind of get across the line and get the best deal if that's the situation that you find yourself in. And it's probably maybe a, quite a common thing that people find themselves in at the moment. I've seen a few that have that went down this route and come to fruitation where the tenant buys the property in different circumstances. It might be the right choice for people depending on the financial circumstances and things. So it's a good one for us to cover today. Um, I think, I think it's utter madness. Not. I think it's utter madness selling to a tenant. <laughs> I know you are, we not, are we nuts here? Selling to your tenant, open the open market. But there's yeah. reasons why you would want to sell to your tenant. And here's what we're going to talk about right now. There's huge yeah. advantages in selling to a tenant um, for the certain right, the right type of person, the right type of landlord, the right type of investor. It makes absolute sense. And we're going to discuss it here. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what is really important that if it is, if that opportunity arises, is it right for you and is it the right circumstances and things? And it's not always clear whether to say yes or no if you come that uh, if that opportunity comes in front of you, particularly when it's unexpected and it means maybe changing your plans. And if you've got a if you've got a journey and a goal in mind for your financial uh, future, maybe that's not part of the plan, and you need, really need to establish whether that's the right um, choice for you or not. Selling to your tenant could be one of those times, and even if you're not planning it, uh, planning to be a landlord for maybe the, for life, do you know people are in. I know you're in it for the long term, Jim, and that's that's it. Um, it doesn't mean you'll never maybe change your management style or the properties that possibly you own. So there's a lot of things to think about. But selling to your tenant is it the best decision for you? And how do you know you've made a good deal or you've made the right deal? So there's plenty to consider. Uh, so before going into that and shaking hands on any deals, I think there's things that you need to think about and we're going to discuss them today. And that will include how much will you actually, uh, how much will actually selling cost you? Do you know there's a lot involved in that? Setting a clear time scale and the right terms surrounding the sale, ensuring you sell for the best possible price. Do you know if you're going to make that decision, make sure you're selling it for the right price. And getting that sale across the line and having the right people help you do that. And of course, for me, all importantly, ending the tenancy correctly. Yeah, definitely. You know, support the things that we're going to talk about then. I've just been through them. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was, I was somewhere else. Oh, you, were, you were preoccupied. <laughs> <laughs> there you go then, eh? Yeah, yeah I know. Uh, I always, people always said to me, Jim, you've got two ears and you've got one mouth. Use them in that proportion. <laughs> I know. Jim was just setting up the, uh, us on TikTok and Instagram Live. So, um, we'll so it was in mid flow. And I never picked yeah. up on that conversation that you said with that about, about you know, the, the, things that you're, uh, the things that you were talking about. Um, it's selling to a tenant is, well, it's interesting that you said, Richard, about life. You know, you're a landlord for life. It's like, so how long is going to be? How long is life going to be? Um, and it will all depend on what situation you're in. That's all it comes down to. But it also is, a, is what you said previously, and I know that's what you probably said because we've got a script anyway. Um, but but the key, the key here is, um, does it actually match your life your life goals? Um, and and everyone, planet, life yeah. goals, life goals. We're getting a bit dreamy here. We're getting a bit pie in the sky stuff. And we start talking about life goals and aspirations, getting a bit wishy washy with people. Um, you know, it, it, that, it, it is what it is. You can call it and you can dress it up by another name. But the reality is, what do you want to achieve? What is your ultimate goal? You have to know where you're going before you know where to start. Um, yeah. if you, it's like playing a game of football. If you take away the goals, there's not going to be any score. Nobody's no, nobody's going to know what know what to do. There's, yeah, so there, there, there's a game pointless exercise. Game yeah, it's a completely pointless exercise if you're playing a game of football and you take away the goals. Just like what you're doing right now, what you're wanting to aspire to in life, what you're wanting to, what you want, what you want your journey to be. If you just want to get rat arsed every weekend and live for the weekend all the time, and that's all you ever want to do and work nine to five Monday to Friday, then fill your boots. This is the wrong show. <laughs> for you because really this is all about 
maybe this is touching on wealth creation as well, but it's also as, touching as on as people's actually. aspirations, people's goals, what they want to achieve, why they want to do certain things, why they want to do it like this, why they want to do it like that. Um, and a bit, a bit of us mixed in in terms of that. You know, I've been a landlord for 30 years now. It, most people know I bought 30 properties the last couple of weeks for yeah. my portfolio um, for 1.9. Um, and, 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 and I see it as, a, as the best thing, you know, ever in terms of financial return but also the best thing for me for almost like um, doing something for someone else, you know, using my capital and my money to put a roof over somebody's head and with a decent return. It's no mind blowing, but but over a period of time, it's a it's a good compounded return um, better than anything else, I would say. Um, yeah. But so that's what I'm using my capital for rather than actually just sticking into a pension and no giving a shit about anybody else and what it could do for them. And we all know pension companies are all designed to maximize its profit as much as possible uh, for the investor, which is quite right. Um, but they'll they'll often invest in unethical investments, you know, things like smoking, bar industries, Diageo, drinks company, um, pharmaceuticals. You know, and then then also um, the uh, um, bar, you know, smoking and, and what was the other one? Gambling, bet fair and stuff like that. So these companies are all companies that take advantage of people's addictions or illnesses. So then I come back to saying what one's more moralistic, <laughs> moralistic yeah. in terms of the aspirations? Is it putting a roof over somebody's head or is it taking advantage, advantage of people's addictions and, 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 yeah. and their illnesses and to make money? Do you know, it's true what you say, Jim. And you've obviously just got that across the line with these uh, 30 properties and that's fine and it's, it's really beneficial to you in terms of building your portfolio and things and how you plan to expand and and have things set up for the future and your future generations but at the same time you saved i mean there's th these are all tenanted they're all filled and without your intervention over time these 30 people would have been totally displaced in terms of where they live in their house uh, these 30 people so, would be homeless straight away. Got, the 30, got the 30 families, just yeah. to understand, the 30, the 30 families, and it's probably about 100 people or more in total, uh, they all would have lost their homes because I know this landlord was heading for the end. That, that's it, ultimately, because they were locked into Section 24 and they'd made, you know, they couldn't they couldn't see any other way out and their mortgage themselves up to about 85, 90% loan to value. So there was no way they were going to get them refinanced on a 75% mortgage and somewhere else. So they were on variable rate, the highest rate possible. So all these people would have made, been made homeless through no yeah. fault of their own. So, you know, another thing, you know, I managed to save all their tenancies. Now, yeah. let's just let's just drill down that a bit just before we go on to this main subject about this, about selling to your tenant. Um, the government wouldn't have done that because I went to Jenny Gilruth, uh, who was our local MSP, and said, this guy's in trouble. You know, 30 properties, 30 families will be displaced. And she went, well, yeah, we're not really bothered. Yeah. That was ulti ultimately a response, but not really bothered. What, what would you know? Want to know and have some sort of intervention, or even see if you can do something? Nah, they wouldn't. They weren't they bothered. weren't bothered at all. And they would just be added on a very, very long list of uh, homeless. Uh, they'd be bothered when the people are out in the street because they'd be pointing the finger at the private landlord and say, "That's what private landlords do to you." Yeah. But they wouldn't be bothered about saving them and stopping that happening. They're there to, they're there. The, the typical, you know, typical politician, I'll, I'll be honest and, and about this, and I could say what I want really because I'm not in anybody's pocket. Typical politician sits in the cheap seats and castigates the people in the arena fighting it out and making it happen. Mm -hmm. That's your typical politician. They'll sit there and they'll, they'll, they'll niggle at everybody and they'll niggle at the person fighting out and they'll niggle at the person running their business. They'll niggle at the person trying to be better and educate themselves more in order to help everybody else around about them. They'll niggle at the person helping their community and all the rest of it, but they'll never, ever get in there with them and do it. Yeah. They'll sit on the cheap seats and castigate them and vilify them, just like they do with private landlords, who is incidentally saving all the people from being homeless at this point in time. We have 20% of the UK housing stock. Social housing providers have 17% of the UK housing stock. We are the biggest social landlord or landlord in Britain. And I would say social, because I'm yeah, probably more social than the social good, landlord. Uh, yes. uh -huh. Yeah, definitely. So, That's uh, no, that good point. over. Yeah, but no, a good <laughs> point made, I think, definitely. So, um, but yeah, but as you say, we're going to talk today about, obviously, um, selling to your tenant and 
we're going to cover some tips and things that could really help you decide whether selling your property to your tenant is the right choice. And not just for now, but for the long term and for your, your long term financial freedom. So, I mean, let's look firstly at what selling uh, will actually cost you. Because mm. selling to your tenant can be an opportunity for some, depending on the situation, and it does open new unexpected doors. But it's still worth taking the time to decide whether you really want to sell. Now, if the answer is yes, the next step is looking at what the associated costs following that will be um, and what you need to uh, look at um, paying out for selling and is it really worthwhile for you? So, I mean, firstly, and I, it was the first thing that came to my mind and uh, it's on here as a uh, first point and it's commission to your letting agent because your letting agent ultimately um, will be doing the introduction to the tenant and, yeah. and, and being that middle person. So along with solicitor fees and early repayment charges uh, on your mortgage, if you're, if you're in the middle of a mortgage uh, term, you have to have uh, early release fees, you'll have solicitor fees, and that obviously um, work that your letting agent is going to do in between and the introduction and mediation yeah. um, throughout that sale, you're going to have costs associated with all of that. So that, as, when you tally that all up, I mean, that's going to come to a few thousand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would yeah. say so. You know, that, that definitely is. Uh, so it's still, it's still, it's still, it still will cost you to sell, uh, regardless. Mm -hmm. You know, the loss of income is probably in any future. I'm a big fan of do not chop down the tree that bears the fruit. Yeah. Oh and my! People might have their blinkers on and think, "Oh, I'll get this money straight away," but that's not going to last you. What you happens what is, is, what happens is, Richard, um, uh, your reptilian brain in the middle here. It doesn't change. It's always there, flight or fight response. It'll never change. You'll never program it for anything else. It is there to protect you. That's why it does it. So you have to understand how it works and then be able yeah. to ignore it sometimes. Hence the reason why you get the Brownlee brothers and everything, you know, being able to win fantastic triathlons and then, you know, carrying each other over the finish line because they're just switching off yeah. their rep reptilian brain, ignoring it and getting across the line. So that's what you've got to learn to ignore at these points in times. But your reptilian brain kicks in when you start to get hurt with something, like it becomes personal because the tenant doesn't pay the rent or because they wreck the house or something like that. But 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 we, we, when you when you ignore that, concept and ignore that that, that you know the, what it's thinking uh, then you actually realize um uh, you know it's like well if, if i put somebody else in i get the right tenant you're not you're not going to get bad tenants it's like but it's like bad landlords bad tenants and bad landlords are very very few and far between you just get to hear about it intensely because it's negative news and that's what sells and that's what Public gets traction. Media, People media. don't want to know about the fact that, oh, my tenant did fantastic yesterday. They paid their rent on time. What's newsworthy about that to anybody? And they don't, they don't care. It's like, so mm -hmm. what? What are you telling us for? Most people would say that. Why are you telling us? Everything worked for you. Because I'm telling you because... The buy to let sector is not as draconian as you think. It's not as uh, as not as uh, bad as you think. Um, and 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 even you know the tenant sector as well is like fantastic tenants out there. And it's and it's ridiculous. That everybody just you know you just get all these negative stories. But we're we're here to live with it. But if you understand that, that's why then you don't take this knee jerk reaction about the fact that, oh, I'll just sell it because my reptilian brain kicks in and, and I don't like the emotional turmoil and the fact that this could happen again and my flight or fight goes, oh, if it happens again, you'll be wiped out. And it's like the, mm -hmm. the, the chances of that happening again and probability analysis is like 0. 0.00001%. It's, it's 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 very rare, especially if you're screening somebody out and you're using a professional letting agent to do that. I, and I'm talking about no letting agent that started in the last five years. I'm talking about a letting agent that's been around for about at least 10 or 15, 20 years. It, it actually knows that market. It actually understands that because they're probably they're probably landlords themselves or investors themselves. I think that's the key here because yeah. um, they understand your pain. They under, But they've, they've gone through all the process. I was talking, I was just mentioning Linda Martin's uh, does property flips and refurbs yeah. this morning. It's invaluable to learn from somebody else's wisdom uh, rather than actually learning from experience because experience costs you a hell of a lot more money. And and if, it, and if it fails because you've just tried and tested something, you're going to lose a lot of money, but you could end up losing everything. Um, and yet, why would you know, just pay for some pay for somebody's wisdom Somebody actually knows what they're doing, by the way. It's got a track record in this. No, just try to sell your courses, but pay for somebody else's wisdom and get that wisdom so it can fast track you to the results. That's probably the best thing to do. So this is where it comes back to about the loss of the income. You've got to factor that in. 
I did it recently in Ely when someone was saying to me, I'm actually, I've got a holiday let. I want to sell it because we come and live in it now and again. I want to sell it because we want a bigger one in the in the Ely area. Mm-hmm. And I went, okay, let's work this out then. So, you know, how much are you making a year? And she says, 25,000 a year. Okay. Uh, how long is it going to take you to get a new a new property? And she went, oh, I'll probably take me a, a couple of years to get another property in Ely because it's few and far between. And obviously it's a yeah, specific one, type yeah. of property they're after. Okay, so you've lost 50,000 pounds straight away. So you've got to factor that into your calculations about how much it costs. Well, how much is it going to cost to stay? Oh, 180,000 to, to, to change the property into what it should be and make it bigger because we've got permission to do it now. So it's going to cost 180 grand to do that. So it says, well, it's only going to cost 130 grand because you've still got your income coming in. You're 25,000 a year because you've no sold the asset. So it's only in true in real terms cost you 130 grand. So therefore, what else have you got to think about? Well, it's the cost of selling and the cost of buying. So how much is it going to cost to sell? It's going to cost that. How much is it going to cost to buy? Well, it's 750,000. So your stamp duty is going to be 60 grand (laughs) to buy. And your selling fees are going to be 10 grand. So you're 70 grand in. So 130 is now 60,000 pounds. Really, it's going to cost you to stay where you are for that for that huge improvement. How much value are you going to add on when you put the 180 on? Oh, well, as, well I know what it's going to be. It's going to be another 200,000. So you're going to spend 60 grand in real terms to get 200,000 uplift. Yeah, 200, yeah. Yeah, see how that works? And it's exactly the same with this, about the loss of income and any future increase in your property sales and rental values, along with giving the asset up uh, to uh, refinance and expand. Uh, all these different things and, yeah. and the opportunity cost and the opportunity loss of actually making that decision and not making that decision has to be factored in that equation. There's no surprise when I tell everybody I used to work in industry and, and as a custom management accountant and therefore yeah. every single bit of capital expenditure always got approved on me because <laughs> I always came up with a justification about why you need to get this bit of equipment. Uh, the, the engineers loved me. Because the very fact is, you used to just take a. I really need this bit of equipment. I'm going to struggle to get this through at the board uh, about the payback and the return. And I went, give it to me here. Yeah. Tight, 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 tight. There you go. There's the answer you want. Board approved. Bang. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really important to think about that uh, that cash flow and the income and how that's going to affect you if you don't have it. And like you say, giving up the asset itself is really is really. And that was a really good example of that, Jim. Here's, what here's about, another one as well. About, Capital gains. Yeah. I was just going to say, what about capital gains? Yeah, ah, capital gains as well. You've got to factor that in. If you sell the asset, you're going to be nailed for capital gains if it's had appreciation mm-hmm. in it. So if you bought it for 100000 and now it's worth 200000 you've held on to it all that time, you're going to get a small allowance. I think it's three grand as from April the 1st um, yeah. for that. And you might get your, your partner's allowance. If you're married, if your wife, husband or wife, spouse, if you're married, uh, then you'll get their allowance to pull into that. So you've got £6,000 allowance. But you're still due capital gains on £94,000. In that scenario so yeah. literally if you're a higher rate at uh, 94 uh, times 0.28 uh, you'll be due 26 000 pound so you're rubbing your hands thinking i'm going to get a hundred thousand out of this by selling it's like no you know you're going to get no. 70 grand and then you're going to chop down the tree that bears the fruit and if you're making six or seven thousand pound a year maybe ten thousand pound a year then then that's something grand really 60 grand but then you've got to think what are you going to invest in with that money that you get the 70 grand to get that £10,000 every single year that you've just chopped in the tree for. Mm-hmm. So again, you come back to saying to yourself, okay, uh, if I don't ever buy another thing and I just invest in a normal account, you know, a, 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 a savings account, I'm going to get 2%. So literally, um, with that money, 70000 times 0.02, um, I'm going to get £1,400 a year. So minus the £10,000, uh, literally every single year it passes, you're losing £8,600. So if you're never going to have that asset and you're never going to buy another asset and you're just going to put it in a savings account and you would have that property for tw- the next 20 years, you're going to make a loss as well of £172,000. You shouldn't be selling no. <laughs> at that point in yeah, time. And, and you you mentioned it already. And just as you see there, if, if the plan is to then obviously buy another property or another rental property and, 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 and re-establish an income, but then you've got to think, well, that's another setting home. That's a setting home. So then you're going to have stamp duty as well. 6%. Six percent, yeah. So you're gonna, so it's, it's madness to think like that. Just refinance the property if the numbers work, and take the money out and and pay the capital, pay pay the income tax hit on it, because you're going to have yeah. to take a, a, a hit on it. If it's a limited company, you can maybe take it out in dividends if you've got enough profits for distribution. That's key here. You can't distribute dividends 
if you don't have the profits you're generating for that, that's to stop everybody being insolvent, you know, in terms of that. Because it's like you can get loads and loads of loans and you can take them out in dividends and it's like, but you're insolvent. That's So mm -hmm. that you can't do that under the law. It's impossible to do that in accountancy and accountancy profession. So you'll never get anybody to sign off your accounts. So yeah. that's impossible to do. But you can still take the money out as maybe an income. Um, and therefore, if you took out an income, you'd be taxed, personal tax, national insurance and stuff like that. If yeah. you're an employee of your company, um, therefore, you've got, you've got to, you've, you've got to, for want of a better word, wash it that way, <laughs> launder it. It's not really a London, is it? But but that's it. It's not really the most tax efficient way to do things. Yeah. Um, but again, you've got to think about that. That has to be factored into account. The long term prospects of losing 172,000. I talked about buying a hurricane. How a Lamborghini Huracan is £178,000 to buy today. But if I bought it, I would lose the chance of making £2 million over 20 years with that same money. Why would I be buying a Lamborghini Huracan then? Yeah. That would be madness. Yeah. This type of situation is it's a really good um, opportunity to look at the opportunity cost, basically. Because then we see about obviously the second home, and then you've got stamp duty. But then you've also got the legal cost. You've also got the mortgage application. And you've yeah. also got any improvements you need to make to that property to make it fit for a uh, purpose or even make it the uh, compliant with legislation if you're going to do another rental property. So there's loads of things to factor in there. We're going to talk about so price think, in a minute. So so we'll yeah. get to that. So we'll talk about that yeah, later. I was just going to say after you've added all that cost up um that apply to wh whatever your plan is to do uh, moving forward, the question to ask yourself is whether selling your home to your tenant will really make you better off than keeping your investment and the income for the long term. <laughs> Jim, your answer is always going to be no for you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's no in every world. The only thing that's going to drive you is is the circumstances surrounding it. So it's just going to be your circumstances. You know, if if you need the money for something else desperately or anything like that. But we'll talk about that more. Yeah. Are your timescales and uh, and terms clear? I mean, selling to your tenant can help you avoid any repairs, decorating, for example, and contractors you might need. When you're putting your your property on the market, it's that's an easy one because it, if it needs a complete refurb, yeah. and it's going to cost you the best part of twenty grand to do that, then there's another thing you've got to factor into your your opportunity cost, opportunity loss of selling and, and keeping, yeah. um, and 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 then we'll remove uncertainty over over when you'll find a buyer as well, because then if you sell it and you maybe ideally if you want if you if you're going to sell it to a tenant, then fair enough, you've got people in occupation. Um, but if you're going to sell it in the open market, then you'll have to put your tenant out and therefore you'll have to go through the legal process. And therefore that might cost you money that you have to factor in as well to get op open, um, to get vacant possession, because that's where you'll get the better price on the open market more than likely. However, we did this in Somerville Avenue where I got an exceptional price in Somerville, yeah. Somerville Avenue. Uh, maybe about in 2019 when I took a flight of madness and thought I should sell everything off. It's like, it's like, so it's like so shut up, Jim. <laughs> so poor, so and I think you've seen the light. <laughs> although, like, although, shut up, Jim. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, what are you talking about? Your wee reptilian brains blooming, giving you the wrong signals here. It's like, yeah. then I ran out and bought another 50. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And um, I think that at the same time, it's worth considering a few other things before obviously you jump in. And I mean, your tenant that's in place they might be looking for a bit of a discount and they might think oh, i've been here for years i've been paying you thousands of pounds in rent um and maybe they think well there's no harm in asking but remember the tenancy and the selling price are entirely separate do you know they've been mm. paying that rent for obviously living in the property and to help do with you know, improvements and things as you go along it's nothing to do with the sale there's an often common misconception about with some tenants at the fact that they feel they should get a discount because they've been paying rent yeah for all these years and i'm thinking no all you're doing is paying for the running cost of the property and the fact that you've got no obligation to repair and improve this property and it's the least cost and rent you'll ever pay for being in a property ownership mm -hmm. is the highest is the is the is the highest cost no it's not highest cost you'll ever pay is rental ownership is actually the least cost you'll ever pay because you'll have to pay for repairs improvements well, and all that goes with it so, so that's flip side. Sorry, I got that wrong. And um, but the key here is um, taking. Take, I, I wouldn't be expecting a discount at all. Not in this type of market. No. I wouldn't be giving anybody any concessions, any discount at all. 
But it's still clear here where I would say to most people is I would possibly still employ an estate agent, even if it's to sell to your tenant. We'd because of your estate agent, your, involved, if think, you've got yeah. a really good estate agent that's got fantastic negotiation skills, they'll be worth their weight in gold. Mm -hmm. They'll get the five and 10,000 more that you probably would have folded it. And it's yeah. like, don't kid yourself. Oh, I'm a great negotiator. What do you do? Or work in the hospital. How's how's that developed your negotiation skills? You know, or I work some. You know, you work nothing in an industry, and I've never had any experience of negotiating with people. I just think I'm really good at it. Don't kid yourself. Yeah. It's like and you I know. Think, I think as well the the thing that you see happen in these kind of situations, that, and and no matter how much a good relationship you have with your tenant, and a lot of people do, and that's great. Make sure you agree the right time scales and, and things are all done properly. Get a professional in to kind of be that middle person and negotiate properly. Because if you just be quite um, relaxed and let things drift through and, and things are just and because you're too familiar with the tenant, that's when yeah. things can become I, a bit messy. I tell you, you a great you idea. Right if you want a hybrid sort of method and mm -hmm. it's worth proposing to a really good negotiator, actually just ask them to negotiate on your behalf on a private sale. Yeah. And uh, and pay them a agree a fee to do that, you know, rather than a state agency fee or anything like that. Just go to somebody that knows what they're doing and say, you know, if if you negotiated this for me, I could, you know, I could pay you a couple of grand or something. Um, and I know for them, and you think to yourself, it's 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 the it's the time involved. It's like you only took half an hour to negotiate that place for me. You're not paying for the person's time. You're paying for their expertise and skill. Yeah. If you were paying for time, you know, if you're paying for uh, people that pay for time, never get me. I will never entertain them yeah. because I'm not a time person. You're not buying my time. You're buying my expertise and skill. And it's the same with you, Richard, as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. buying, you're buying your expertise and skill. You're certainly not paying by the hour for time. That's not what it is. So you'll get someone's time as a really good skill negotiator and you'll understand that. And like anything else, you should pay for it. And if people go, why should I pay for that? Because I can get a free valuation. Well, that's fine, but it's free. They've not got any obligation about the price and what they've just said. They've mm -hmm. got no come. You've got no comeback against them either. If anything goes wrong in that conversation, if you get it wrong or, or, or you and 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 it doesn't happen because you use that knowledge and expertise from an estate and, and thought, yeah, they could tell me. Because I often get people that come out and you know they bring me out and then they go, hey, I've got free advice and I'll go with somebody else's cheapest chips. And the next minute I look at their price and it's going down and it's going down and it's going down. Yeah. It's going down. And it's like, you idiot. It's yeah, like, why did you, did you know, see, but, but you can't convince everybody and you can't be everything to everyone. Yeah. And some people just get it and some people are just left behind. That's ultimately it. So, as you said, Richard, even though you've got a great relationship with your tenant, make sure you agree a time frame with them so things don't drift into being too relaxed and too familiar. Yeah. Because they're and just that, like, that's a really, that's a really oh, common I'm thing. Just, I'm just yeah. getting my mortgage arranged. It's like, you know, so are you started? Oh, well, I've still a, I've still a contact the mortgage advisor. It's like, flipping heck, that, I'm wanting to get this sold in the next three months. Yeah. And this is the next thing we're, we're going to talk about. Uh, and it might seem, Quite obvious to a lot of people but if you're going to sell to your tenant are they actually in a position to buy the property do you know do they have their mortgage in place do every they have their affordability time, and richard yeah. every single time i've had that question are you in a position to buy a property when i ask the the person speaking to me saying oh my tenant wants to buy it i go back to them and say that you should really qualify them and every single yeah. time they've come back and said the tenant can't afford it yeah they've not got the deposit they've not got a mortgage they kind of get the mortgage um at numerous things yeah that's why the rent because they can't get that mortgage. They can't get anything like that. That's why most people are actually renting, but also it suits their lifestyle as well. They maybe yeah. don't want the they don't want the 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 commitment of having a mortgage on a property, which they're going to use for two or three years. And the entry and exit costs are going to be huge in comparison to to, to buy and sell in comparison to just renting. So that's why they would do that. So really Please confirm if your tenant's in a position to, you know, to do that and confirm uh, they could buy the property. Ask to see their mortgage arrangement in principle. Yeah. Check with a solicitor even if they're nervous about that because the solicitor will be able to confirm that because the solicitor will, will pin their colours to the mast if it's true. They will not say anything if it's not. They will just say they don't have that at all or I can't confirm that because and that gives you all the all the warning signs that are going on there. Uh, along with things like bank statements and, uh, say, and also 
ask your exactly. solicitor as well to confirm they've actually got the deposit because the solicitor yeah. would get sight of that so they can confirm it. We've done that loads and loads of times. Yeah. And a lot of people think, well, I can't ask to see their bank statements. Of course you can. <laughs> of course you can. You're, in just this about, situation. you're just about to sell them the house. I know, I know. I know but this, that's is, what... this comes this comes back to the the the, the scenario i used to get years and years ago where people said um people said well i've got a right to have your house because i've inquired and i went right my house is a hundred thousand pound you're going to pay 500 pound to get access to it mm -hmm. do you think that's fair that you should have all the rights no uh, my house is a hundred grand it's the probably the, one of the biggest assets outside of my normal house i've got myself and um, so the last thing i'm going to give you is access to my house a hundred thousand pound for 500 pound a month yeah. you have to jump through the hoops to make sure you're in a position to afford it and it's my job and fiscal responsibility just like the banks to make sure you can afford it and do my due diligence on you exactly like the banks do stress testing your requirements stress testing your circumstances to make sure you can't afford to buy this or can't afford to rent it yeah also the uh, the rental payments and, and it really needs to be made clear that the rent is still payable on a monthly basis in advance until the day that the sale actually completes yeah. um, or until otherwise agreed. I mean, if you agree something different, then that's up to you. But some tenants may think, oh, well, I'm buying the property. I don't need to pay the rent now. But that's not the case. Up until that changes. <laughs> I've seen that. Yeah, I've seen that happen. It's like, I'm buying it, though. It's like, all right, but you're still renting it. In the meantime, though, but we're still, we're still in a contract for rental, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go to my bank and ask them if we can just get my holiday because my tenant's buying the property. Can I just get a holiday and no pay the mortgage anymore because the tenant's buying it and they don't want to pay their, their rent? I know what the answer that's going to be. And it's probably going to be go forth and multiply. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I think ultimately you need to be sure, as sure as possible, uh, that the convenience and certainty of selling your tenanted property or selling to the tenant is a good, as good as it seems and doesn't have any hidden surprises and misunderstandings and things. You need to be mm. really clear on that. And if you're not, or you're not capable of executing that, get someone professional to do it for you. Yeah. I've actually had a circumstance of Richard where the tenant um, years ago, know myself personally, but for a, for mm -hmm. a landlord selling, where the tenant deliberately ran the house down to actually devalue it so they could buy it at a lower price. They actually deliberately engineered that process to do it. Now, again, that's an isolated incident. Mm -hmm. And that was in East Nuke. They deliberately actually started to Devalued destroy the, the house. house. Yeah, to, to make it less of a value. So when the valuer came down to do it, and I said to the guy, I said, you just need to get rid of this person and get vacant possession. Because the price between that and, and what you could get in the open market with just maybe about five or six thousand pounds worth of investment is going to be about thirty to forty thousand pounds extra. And it and it made absolute sense. And he did do that and follow that advice and subsequently he got he got I think he actually got more than that, to be honest. Yeah, and that that's uh, that's where then obviously your advice is coming well. So let's talk about that, Jim, and, and let's see, like, are you getting the right price for your property um, when you're selling it to your tenant? Well, your tenant's idea of a um, fair price <laughs> for buying your property is probably completely different from what yours is. Yeah. Um, so it makes sense to get some experts and neutral guidance um, on that reasonable figure. Um, I don't think it's reasonable figure. I think it should be market value, at least at this point in time in this type of market. Um, but then you have to weigh up your desirability as a as a landlord. Um, if you know you want a quick exit, it could be an easy option. Um, and how easy the tenant would actually work with you um, if you decide to sell an open market, because some tenants are like, I've got, I'm, I'm not entitled. I've got no entitlement to actually let you in this property. I don't have any responsibility to do that. I can avoid anybody coming in this property until the day that I leave this property legally. Um, so if your letting agent, um, uh, depending on your property, was rented out, here's a number of options to consider in this process. Well, if your letting agent also deals with sales, uh, they'll probably be able to give you an accurate idea of how much you should actually sell for. Um, if Do you you're think using a letting agent and you've rented the property uh, privately, uh, get the opinion of two or three local estate agents. I'm just going to say, what do you think getting compar comparable opinions is, is the I'm right really, I'm not really sure because you, you really have to have an experience, a, a, an estate agent with experience in this exact matter. And, and I'll be honest, I can't think of any other estate agent that's actually got that experience that that we've got 
and I, and I know that's like that's like oh that's really big headed but the reality is I don't know any stage and with 30 years experience in the buy to let business and property investment and wealth building coupled with a huge amount of experience and in, in the sales market as well and understanding and also the experience frontline because remember I used to manage all my properties the first yeah. 30 to 35 properties I actually self-managed and actually did all the refurbishment myself while actually working in industry as an accountant and um, so I've got that personal experience and understanding of where you are there and also got the personal experience of using the lane engine also got the personal experience in that as well and you have that benefit and access to that information as well and that's why we do things like the wealth creation show because you get you get you you begin to learn that and I begin to reinforce that with oh, yeah. myself that's what people don't realize about the wealth creation show. It's actually a opportunity for us to learn. Yeah, that's definitely. <laughs> it's yeah. not really for it's not really for anybody else, <laughs> but we're just <laughs> broadcasting it publicly so everybody can see. Well, I mean, we're on we're on episode 112 on Monday, um, which is just crazy to think that we've done so much. But the amount that that I've took from it, and I know you in turn you as well, Jim, and, and it's it's just been amazing. So uh, yeah. I mean, really enjoy doing it. But yeah, what so, you say about different agents, Jim, and I see quite a lot that if you get several different agents out and People will have, they'll have maybe a really overinflated valuation and maybe a, a lower valuation, and then they're, they're left with these maybe two or three completely different opinions on the valuation. And then the person's left there thinking, well, who's right, who's wrong? And so then, it, really, the only way to it is here. Yeah. So here's the valuation that we do typically. There's the market appraisal, all the information, and here's yeah. all the comparables. Here's all the comparables here. So we've yep. got the first property, it obviously matches that, and, and that's mm -hmm. what it was sold for and when it was sold. We've got the next property, we've got the next property, and then we go into all the detail for the next property and the next property and uh, other people's properties as well. So we yeah, go through agents, all that yeah. before we even walk in the door. And therefore, we know more or less spot on exactly what the home report is going to come in at. Where, and that's where I think, where yeah. I, don't, I, I suspect, and I this is not me saying this, this is what the client say to me. Um, I say, so where do you think they got this other valuation? Did they show you comparables like this for other estate agents? And they go, no. no and and I just go, yeah, so, what do, you think, so yeah. what do you think they did? You just plucked a figure out there and thought, I think it's probably around about that. And I'll just get the surveyor to agree with. Yeah. That's, that's what I and think that's they're what, doing. That's what happens. I know that's what happens, yeah. That's yeah, what I think they're doing. Unless your agent can sit in front of you and provide you with evidence of recent sales and comparables and explain to you how they've got to that point of valuation and where they're at, how they're at that price point and show you the, the comparison and alternatives and even show you, because the client's expectation will always maybe be yeah. a bit different from what you're telling them. So then you need to maybe think, and if you've had the right conversation before you go out, you'll know what their expectation is. And if it's not what the actual valuation is, you then need to show them evidence of, where their expectation is in comparison, this is what you get for what you were expecting for the value. So that's a sweet Tell you a really good one I did. Um, exactly on that one yesterday, actually. Yeah. Um, I went out to see them and there was like, it's actually a buyout. So somebody else right. is buying out somebody else. And I says, to be honest, this isn't going to work out well. I've seen this scenario before um, where you get your estate agent, I get my estate agent, we come to consensus about where it is. But I think to be transparent, I, I said to them, you should maybe just split the cost and go halfers on a, a, a chartered surveyor to do it. Because yeah. then the chartered mm -hmm. surveyor does a scheme one valuation, which is around about 150 quid. It's mm -hmm. neither here nor there to get that honesty. And so yeah. you can actually maintain your relationship with whoever that person is. Because you might have a really good relationship with your tenant. And the last thing you want to do or, or you want to feel and they want to feel is going away from this transaction thinking they lost in the, in, in the process. Um, and they felt compelled because they couldn't move anywhere else because there wasn't anywhere else available that suited their needs as a tenant and all the stuff was in the house and they didn't want that disruption. Cause see, from a tenant's point of view as well, it's 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 advantageous for them to actually stay there because they don't need all the costs of moving anymore and all mm -hmm. the costs of buying, really, because even though they're buying it from you, they don't need to go through the whole time, all the time of searching for the right property and even moving into the property and then realising sometimes that it's like, well, this isn't what I expected it to be. If they're really happy where they are, why are you no charging them a premium to buy? Yeah. It's like it's this misconception in people's minds about, oh, because it's got a tenant and it, it should be 20% of the value. Uh, okay, that's your that's your below market value sourcers actually yeah, yeah. spilling out that information. Yeah. That's no your estate agents that say that. 
And that's no your that's no your surveyors. The true price is actually the price with vacant possession, and that's what you should be paying for, not some you know fire sale price. If if everything goes wrong and you've got a certain tenant, here's the price that it should be to someone else. It's not no the numbers work at the actual valuation price or or above that. So go go halfers, um, you know, or even just. It's 150 quid. To, yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, at that level, you, I would put myself personally, and if I was selling you could tenant, also, I would just cover it, yeah. You could also be then proving clearly to the tenant that you're above board and fair about the whole process by mm -hmm. actually getting a proper qualified uh, RICS surveyor. So um, uh, that's the um, Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. Institution of Chartered Surveyors. Uh, um, so, so that's what could demonstrate to your tenant clearly that you're all above board and make everything go so smoothly. Yeah. Remember, this is if you're an investor and this is only one property and you've got other properties, you want a sterling reputation out of this. You want a tenant to walk away feeling they've got a good you've got a good reputation and you want that being intact. And you really want to risk that for a few thousand pounds over the long term? Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't risk anything like that. I don't take yeah, chances. Um, I make sure I make sure everything's in place and people come out with a win-win situation. That's what I was just going to say. Do you know what I picked up on what you said there, Jeremy? It was just to kind of uh, we maybe digress a wee bit, but. In any sales transaction, you've got the buyer and the seller. If one of them are coming out like if, if the seller thinks, oh, I've accepted too low, or the or the buyer thinks I paid too much, then you've not had that's not a successful sale. And yeah, you need I to felt, have both I parties. Felt, I felt cheated. And, yeah, and especially if you're in it long term, you're going to get a reputation um and people are going to talk about you, and therefore it could end up damaging your reputation. Definitely. And then if you're a sourcer, especially people might not actually come to you because mm -hmm. then other people are telling them it's like this guy just completely talk, ripped me yeah. off and took advantage of me. Yeah. Or or this or this girl, you know, guy or girl. It doesn't yeah. matter. Well, you know, it person. could it could be it could be both. It could be both. It doesn't make any difference. It, this person. Yeah. Um so that I think that's the most important thing. So make sure um you get property value, negotiate the price from the informed position and best way to avoid anyone getting uh, cold feet later on, I suppose. Yeah. So that all being said, pushing the sale across the line and doing and executing that mm. properly is, is something that's really important. And agreeing on a price is only the start of the sale. And there is a lot to do to get your tenant over the line to exchanging, obviously, on the, the contracts and things on, uh, on the sale. So it's a good idea to set aside time um, to really look and uh, look things over. And checking that your tenant has uh, submitted their uh, mortgage application is a really important one. Uh, and that's something that probably gets overlooked and then maybe looked at at the last minute and then, then it's too late sometimes. And that's could that could yeah. really make things follow through. Um, and obviously, like you said, Jim, had uh, a proper independent, independent um, single survey done. By Again, a single one. that's why it comes back to even though you're selling to your tenant, it potentially is worth actually negotiating a preferential fee with a experienced with an experienced estate agency mm -hmm. because then you know if you get them to take the liability and use their experience and expertise they will do all that for you yeah. because this sounds a this i was going to say this sounds like a huge rigmarole but the reality is it is this mm -hmm. is a huge thing to do to understand that process of selling the house. People actually think, oh, it's just you go to solicitor, and you agree a price, and then they just do everything from after that. But no, even solicitors don't understand the whole process. They don't understand. They don't. The solicitors don't understand the circumstances of the of the buyer because they're not. The, the seller solicitor has no idea about the buyer. They then have to ask the buyer solicitor. You know, and then the buyer solicitor then has to be informed about the sell. You know, the the buyer circumstances are where they are in their journey. But sometimes they are they don't have the experience because maybe they've just started or maybe they've just no bothered to check all these things and dot all the you know the eyes and cross all the t's. Um, and I've seen it time and time again, especially when it comes to house sales. You know, where somebody's come and made an offer. Um, a case in point, somebody came and made an offer. And they insisted that their house was sold and under offer in St Andrews. And I was like, okay, so what's the position of your buyer then? And they went, I don't know, I'll have to ask the estate agent. And then when they phoned the estate agent, apparently the estate agent didn't know either. <laughs> <laughs> You're having a laugh, really. <laughs> state agents in Fife. You're the state agent didn't know either, but I don't think that's I don't think that's uh, uncommon. I think that's actually quite a common circumstances where 
But maybe the newer estates don't understand. They've actually got to make sure they qualify the buyers and actually make sure they're actually in a position to do something or they've got the means to buy the property rather than actually just saying, I've got the house sold for 20000 extra and, and they've, they've, not, they've not even got it over the line yet. I see that naivety. By the way, you're not yeah. supposed to do that under the State Agency Act. You're yeah. not supposed to tell people what the price is sold for or the percentage has gone over if it's under offer. You're actually, you could tell them after it's concluded and mm -hmm. it's on the land registry, but you're not supposed to breathe a word about how much you got yeah. for this property be before that. that. And you see all the newer estate agents, the ones that are starting up on their own, coming on and just announcing this care fee. And I'm like, oh my God, why are you playing it? You're just leaving that wide open for liability issues and come back for you. But, but that then, you know, it's that's that, them, that's you know, how they operate. Do you know, I see that a lot when, uh, and you know, Jim, I do closings and things on uh, quite often. And, um, once the closing's finished, and I even have solicitors actually know how much did it go over? And I'm like, well, I can't tell you that. I have no telling you anything. No. But you'd be amazed about the amount of people that actually tell the solicitor, tell the solicitor. Yeah. They'll just volunteer that information. And it's like, oh, why can I not know how many bids are in so far for that closing date? Yeah. None of your business. No. <laughs> all, None all, of your all. business. But I don't say it like that. I deliver it. And this is a yeah. great one. Top tip for estate agents out there how yeah. to do this on a closing date. So if you're listening in estate agents, maybe take take note how to do a closing date if somebody says, how many bids are in so far? Well, I can't really discuss that, obviously. If I said there were 10 bids in there, you would immediately tell your client to push the price up in terms yeah. of their offer. And that's fine. But if I told you there were no bids, you'd probably tell your client to lowball it and make a less of an offer. Yeah. And, and that wouldn't be fair on you and your client, and it wouldn't be fair on our seller as well. So the best way forward is actually... Put your best foot forward, make the best bid that you think your client can do. And what you tell your client in this, this is me educating this listener, what mm -hmm. you tell your client in this scenario is make an offer where if you got it, you wouldn't go away thinking you've overpaid for it. Yeah. But also, if you didn't get it, you could walk away with your head held high and say you put in the best offer possible. No regrets, that's so the offer it should be done from a buyer on a closing date. And that's the advice it should be given to them. Yeah. Not, oh, there's 10 bids. Because the reality is, I've heard, and they are no longer here. They were basically drummed out the door the day they said that, that, that phrase. They said, I could just tell them that they've, they've, we've got six bids in. It, sorry, no. that's called lying. That's yeah. not bending the truth or anything else. That is lying. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. you shouldn't be part of this group anymore. Bye bye. Yeah, and I think as soon as you offer up, I mean that's obviously a different situation because it's not the truth. But even if you if you feel, oh, I'll just offer up that little oh, shivering on the table, you're unintentionally influencing the person's decision or the, oh, how sure. they're going to offer. So no, that's oh, wrong. Sure. Yeah, there's skillful ways to give advice, you know, in order to benefit your seller. Um, but but in a broad sense, just what I said before is the exact yeah. way you should proceed with a closing date if these questions are asked by the buyer solicitor or, or by the buyer themselves, definitely. Yeah, of course. And also um, following up on the whole mortgage process and, and uh, to be to have like the formal written process uh, and the written offer that's being issued checked and, and obviously chasing up maybe any delayed paperwork and things. There's a lot involved, especially if you and, and if you're having to do this because you've not got somebody professional and, and on your side doing it for you you'll then start to feel the heat, like, oh, God, I've got all this to sort out. But um, That is so yeah. true, Richard. I'm actually going through refinance just now. On, well, yeah. actually, no refinance. I'm just moving the mortgage to another product. Mm -hmm. So I'm not refinancing and getting money out of the property. I'm just taking the mortgage and putting it into a better, a better rate. But it's with two different lenders. And would you believe... No, it's the same lender, but it's two properties. Uh -huh. And it's under a portfolio mortgage product where it's both on the one mortgage, these both properties. It's quite interesting. Because one of them completed in the mortgage process, and the both mortgages were approved at the same time by the lender, by the way, but the solicitor, one of them completed about three weeks ago. The other one's exactly the same, and it was done at the same time, but they just phoned us yesterday and said, oh, we're just we're, we're, we're due to try and get it over the line next week. And I'm like, how, would, how does it take you four weeks to do the same thing? We're, di we're a different property from the same point. That's my case in point about making sure you chase the solicitor up or chase whoever it is up at the other end of the transaction to make sure they're on track. This is why it's important as an estate agent, for example, that even though the property is sold subject to concluded missives, 
you still make sure you keep on track with the solicitor every couple of weeks and make yeah. sure everything's still on where it was before. And this is why it's good teaming up with a solicitor that you can know, you like, you you know and trust somebody. So we team up with people I've used and I use just now as yeah. well because I know their processes and understand where they are. But I also know, I know their strengths and I also know some of the, I, I don't, I wouldn't say their weaknesses, but I know the things that I need to keep them on track on. And that's why it's good to do that. Now, every single solicitor has got that problem because they obviously have new people and we're all human and we can all, we all focus on different things and we all see things in a different way. Some of us are process driven. Some of us are not process driven. Um, and I am process driven for that reason. And that's why it's important to do that, that procedure. Yeah. Apparently I'm a high D on the disc profile, which is a, uh, which is a, uh, get out there and get it done process driven um all the way through and uh just leading from the front and <laughs> and just getting on with it and like come on just hurry up everybody it's like hurry up, up. Up. up come on <laughs> come on um that sort of thing so 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 understanding that type of personality is is key in actually getting a skillful negotiation with the other party um and that's why i said before even though you're selling privately maybe it's worth actually engaging the skill and expertise of somebody that knows what they're doing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And regularly chasing up uh, the legal uh, side of things and keeping it on track. And But remember that the, the seller can't speak directly to your buyer solicitor. Uh, so you'll need to have uh, regular updates from your own solicitor. Um, who you've obviously got in place to deal with that. Mm-hmm. So given the need to stay on the case, you might prefer um, to have a state agent or, or somebody like I say, a professional person in that process to help the sale progression for you and uh, a fee that reflects a buyer uh, already being uh, in place, obviously. And, and you obviously will agree that because your buyer's in place as your tenant, but they will expect obviously a fee for doing their work, but it might yeah. need to be uh, amended slightly because there's a different level of work involved. Um, yeah. As well as liaising with both solicitors, agents can be a buffer. Mediation uh, is really important in uh, the case of any maybe hiccups and, and, and delays with uh, the negotiation process. They could handle all that and keep you informed of the progress while you just get on with what you need to be doing. Um, and that's what I am a proper professional in that situation will do for you. And it's all about yeah. doing, doing things that would take up a lot of your time and maybe you don't have the expertise to actually deal with. It, it's the time thing again, isn't it? We're coming back yeah. to time, time, time all the all all, all the time. Excuse the pun, um, <laughs> but but it is. It's the most. It's the most important uh, commodity uh, if I can use for the, that as the word, because it is valuable. Mm-hmm. Your time is the most important thing. You'll never lie on your deathbed and think to yourself, "I wish I had more money." You'll always say, "I wish I had more time." So if you can save yourself the time and doing all these tasks and get someone else to do it on your behalf who's extremely competent and experienced with this. In other words, got the wisdom and done it before loads and loads of times, hundreds of times, if not thousands, then they'll pay you dividends in the time that you'll save. And that time could be used for something else. It's like, you know, whatever you want to do. Like I've, I've, I've had some sellers say to me, it's like, well, I'll just go on. And I'm like, just go on holiday. Just, just give me the keys. Just go on holiday. It's like, really? But do we not have to be here? No. no, I just do everything from start to finish. You don't need to be here at all. We'll even stage the house for you for the right thing. All you need to do is approve the photographs and descriptions and the video content and all the rest of it yeah, when I send it over to you. Yeah. So all you need to do, if you've got access to email, yeah, I've got access to me, great stuff. And just say, yeah, everything's fine. Accurate description, all done, all done and dusted. And then I'll put it on the market. I'll do other viewings. We'll get it all done for you. And, uh, and all you need to do then is discuss exactly what offer you're going to accept. That's it. And that and happens that, quite a lot when people actually take that on board and actually trust me to do that. Yeah. And it's like, I can't believe I'm sitting on the beach. <laughs> and it's like, I've oh, just sold my house. And, and it's, it's like, I've got an astronomical figure for it. I never did anything at all for it. That's the beauty of technology as well. People have it in their hand. And like you say, approving things, it's literally a two word answer. Yes, OK. Yeah, go ahead. That's fine. Um, and then we, we just crack on with what we're doing. So, I've yeah. done this all my life, Richard. At the time that I bought in Spain, which is almost 20 years ago, I've got my mm-hmm. place in Spain. 
Um, so if you walk it back to 2004 and two, 2006 is when I started a stage into business. I was investor as well before that, um, yeah. for about 10 years before that. But 2006 when I started in a stage agency, and uh, and literally at that time I was sitting on the beach negotiating offers, um, and working working remotely. So when COVID came along and everyone, oh, I've got to work from home. How will I cope? And I'm like, I neighbor. Yeah. I just work from home. I don't know what I've got my, yeah. that's why everybody walks about with laptops all the time. Yeah. <laughs> we never had fixed computers. That's why everybody had mobiles all the time with mobile, you know, um, um, date on it. You know, so we could do all these things remotely without even knowing that we we're going to end up working remotely. Yeah. Uh, so that's a huge advantage uh, of where you are right now. And uh, yeah, I, I, I do remember on Everest Base Camp discussing um, negotiating a price of a property and selling it. <laughs> yeah. And I think I did it on the top of Kilimanjaro as well, just to prove a point. I like that, that like can it. be done, yeah, of course. It's like <laughs> I've just sold a house. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so on today's topic, we're going to finish up with something that for me as a light agent is really important, and that's uh, how do you actually end the tenancy and doing that correctly if you're selling yeah. the property to the tenant. And I think after exchange and uh, the, the contracts, things are all done. The final stage uh, of selling the, to the tenant really involves the formalities of bringing the tenancy to an end and making it all clear and clean and tidy at the finish. And I think really, um, firstly, obviously, arranging return of the security deposit. Mm. Uh, are you refunding all of it? Or did you Ooh, pay? That's a controversial one. Or did you I... pay for any repairs during the tenancy? And maybe yeah. you've got the to make for that. This no, is an interesting one, Richard. This yeah. is like car hire companies. I, we recently bought the Hyundai. We had we leased it. We bought it, and yeah. they still sent me a bill for the extra mileage. That's crazy. And it's like, really? But I bought it. It's yeah. like, how how did the extra mileage cost you any money? And so they charged me another three hundred fifty quid. And I thought, well, okay, that, that's the what it is. But it's true when you think about it. If you go back to the property and realise what they bought it and think, well, that was truly, if that had been done how it was in the very beginning, without the damage that you've got in it the now, that price would be a lot higher than deposit. it was. Yeah. Therefore, technically, I should be keeping that deposit because mm -hmm. you made damage to the property. But but other the tenants don't see it, and other people don't see it in that light at all. You know, you could you could understand why. Yeah. But but when you look at it in that context of the two separate transactions is we end the tenancy, you technically move out. Uh, you don't really, but in, in theory, you move out for and, and then therefore I then do a check and I realise that you've done damage to the property. Therefore, it's damage, not wear and tear. Therefore, mm -hmm. that devalued the property. Therefore, you got it cheaper. And then the price I communicated with you was obviously as a result of the damage that the tenant had done. It just so happens the tenant and the person was exactly the same thing. Yeah, no, that's a really important point. And the, the car thing is a good example of that, John. But it's yeah. definitely true. But the, the the bottom line is, if you're in that situation, then maybe you've got deductions to make from the deposit for whatever reason, you will always need to really prove that that is the, the case, um, especially to the deposit scheme who will hold the deposit at that point. And that again yeah. goes into, I mean, we spoke about that a couple of weeks ago, deposit schemes and things, and there's a whole process to do that. Uh, also, if you're, if you're Coming to the end of it, if you're exchanging a sale in the midst of a tenancy, you might be right in the middle of the month and they might have already paid the rent uh, a, a month in advance. So it you might be, have to then would, look at refund. Richard, just to, sorry to interject here, it would be interesting to see how Safe Deposit Scotland actually viewed that, yeah. you know, about selling it to the tenant and whether the, the, the deposit would go back because it's not our decision, is it? No. We can only argue our corner, but I've got yeah. a funny feeling Safe Deposit Scotland would say just, we just send all the money back to the tenant. That, that might be the case, actually, and that's a good. I've got a good point of contact at Safe Deposit Scotland, and that's a question. You should I'm ask asking. that question anyway, yeah. just to a pure curiosity about the fact that if, if we sold to a tenant, you know, would they just get the full deposit back, even though they damaged the property and the property has been devalued as a result of the damage? How so, and that's a really that? good. That's a really good example of having the right contacts as well. I mean, we have. I've got really good contacts at Safe Deposits, and she would answer that question for me straight away. And also, like as letting agents and things that look after a lot of investment for, for people, like we're members of SAW, which is the Scottish Association yeah. of Landlords, and see if we ever in doubt anything, we just pick up the phone and they tell us straight away. And, and it's like, do you know, who else, who else if they're self-managing or, or, or don't use an agent, has that kind of expertise and things 
at their disposal. You need to re- you need to know the right people to write, to get the right answers. See, this is a co- this is a constant learning process, and that's why that this is quite interesting because you don't get normal mainstream agents doing this about just mm-hmm. hypothetical situations and thinking yeah. what would be the answer to that, that, and yeah, actually yeah. going away and asking a body and saying what would be the answer if this happened. Um, but I think uh, testing things like that are are are, are vital in preparation for when anything like that does happen, because it will happen if, you've, if you're if you in this for 20 years, you'll get that scenario at some point in time. And you know you will have the answer or you know you know where to go for the answer. This is why, this is almost like a master's degree. And, and, and it's not the master's, it's not the subject of the master's degree that most people buy your services for, you know, when you're, when you're getting employed and stuff like that. It's the very fact that you've got the educational level to understand what you need to do at that point in time to get a master's degree, to mm-hmm. attain a master's degree. So this is why the accountancy profession looks at, you know, if you have a degree in archaeology, you can become a chartered accountant because it's a learning process. Because we know with the degree in archaeology that you had, it's got nothing to do with accountancy, but it's the very fact that you're able to learn quickly and adapt. It will say to us that you will pass your professional exams. Yeah, and that's why you could. That's why you could join and study to become a, a chartered a chartered accountant. So that's the process, and that's why it's so important. And it comes back to again to the experience and expertise of an agent that understands the dynamics of that. Yeah, definitely, it's so important to make sure that uh, you have an understanding of how things work. And if you're not quite sure, you've always got the right person to turn to who knows the answer. Yeah. Um, also, as well. Cancelling all your policies and things that are relating to the property and the tenancy. So you might have you obviously your landlord's insurance, you might have rent protection in place, you know, all these types of things. Make sure all your policies are brought to an end in time for the exchange as well. And if they're left running, you'll still be charged for them. And, and they're, they're no use to you after that point. So make sure make sure you go to landlord registration and actually take your uh, take your details off the, off the register. Yeah. Make yeah. sure you register from landlord registration because I, this happened the other day with Crammond, and you've probably had a phone call about this. One of the thirty I bought, um, actually, they went to the landlord because he still had his information on the on the register. They mm-hmm. went to the landlord when there was a burst pipe one one neighbour, and it was something like a mutual repair or something to understand what was going on. Yeah. And therefore, they went to them, and he went, "But I've 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 sold it to Jim." Yeah. And and then they came to me, and it's like this could all been sped up if you'd actually done the right thing and actually deregistered yourself from landlord register and not just let it run. Again, this is this is actually understanding the processes and understanding what you need to do in terms in terms of the the changeover and and all the all the checkbook lists. I mean, I had to. I, I spent the best part of three or four months actually trying to understand that and trying to understand the dynamics of getting all the way through and and ticking all the right boxes to make sure mm-hmm. that we had all the right information for the handover because because I'll, I'll be honest if i just left it to the the landlord that was buying from they would have probably just given me a lot of paperwork and says sort yourself among that and um, whereas i was pretty process driven and i made sure i had all the documentation and i made sure i had my spreadsheet and i made sure i had all the dates all the certificates ran out so when we became near the line of conclusion i went back to the gas certificates and i went actually the gas certificate for that one that one that one that one that one, that one it's all due in the next two weeks yeah. After I conclude, I says I want them done before I conclude. So we didn't have any last minute. Oh my God, we're going to have to get the gas certificate done. And in no, the very fact, it, it, maybe, maybe maybe a gas cert turned around and saying, well, you have got to get a new boiler. And it's like, whoa, mm. wait a minute. No, I want these done before we conclude. I yeah. also want another couple of things done as well before we conclude to make sure that that property is actually compliant with the Repair and Standard uh, Repair and Standard Act uh, or the Standard Repair Act and mm. uh, and the you know, all the different legislation that was involved in that, because I don't want to take it over and then have the local authority on me like a ton of bricks going, there was actually something wrong with that property and the last landlord never changed it, but now you own it, you've got to do it. You've got, yeah. And I, that, so and I, I was never, I'm not buying into that, I, you know, so I made, I made sure it was it was perfectly done. Yeah, I mean, it's really important um, to make sure things like that are uh, taken care of. And like you say, like when you were, you're, you're the buyer of this in that situation, and yep. um, it paid, it would pay, it will pay in dividends, but the fact that you are quite uh, thorough in the fact that I need this, I need this, I need this. And I checked through everything when it got handed over and, and it was in quite good shape in that aspect. But also, if you're selling to your tenant, it's really important that 
when the sale completes that you've you've made all these uh, things happen so that the tenancy ends and the sale completes and that um when you're handing over the keys that's all that's all done and dusted and everything's crossed off correctly and everybody's mm -hmm. happy and confident that they are um they are moving forward and everything's been done correctly because it yeah. gets really messy if it's not and that means the tenant can't phone you anymore and say there's a repair to be done yeah <laughs> so that's probably the benefit of that you get your time back because you've no longer got that person saying you've got to do this you need to do we need to do that or there's something wrong here there's something wrong there and, and but then that comes again back down to you know what's driving your 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 point in the first place of selling it and why why are you selling it and that comes back to circumstances the reptilian brain and all the rest of it and just the just the catch in that right moment where somebody goes i just i just don't want to do this anymore mm -hmm. uh, but but i'll tell you the, you know this too shall pass and that'll probably change in a, in, a, in a month's time or maybe in a year's time the amount of times i've had landlords sell off properties and then wish in five years' time, they wish they turn around and say, "Oh God, I wish I hadn't Shouldn't done it." Done that, yeah. I wish I hadn't sold them off. It was a short-term gain for a long-term loss, mm -hmm. um, and overall, it's a huge loss long-term in the compounding wealth that you get as a result of that. And even the opportunity to, you know, you have all these choices that you lose now because you don't have the income coming in, and therefore, when your when your uh, child grows up and says, "Daddy, I need to go to university," you know, and, and I need to have some sort of funding and it's like you, you you can now say i've got some sort of means to help you out yeah and not just well fend for yourself or you'll probably just have to get a job because i can't afford to send you to university mm -hmm. that's quite that's quite worrying for me you know as, that, I, as that, I, is, that is the driver for a lot of people because they do they they understand that and they've had that realization and they thought right of course, and, and of course. We're, we're, i mean wealth what we're we going to talk about in the wealth creation show we're talking on monday we're mastering focus yeah, and, and that's all that month on your focus through that wealth creation journey. That's exactly what we're talking about right now in the conversation and, and yeah. just finishing off here about how to master that focus, how to understand um the long term vision, the medium to long term vision that you've got, and how yeah. to not lose that. Mm -hmm. That's quite an important thing. How to yeah, you know, because a lot of people lose that. a lot of people a lot of people get involved with people who actually uh, kill their dream off. Mm -hmm. You know they've, they've maybe wanted this and and the other person or the other people are involved in um uh, oh that's not a great idea that doesn't sound right and all the rest of it and because you're in with these people and you you you, you trust them at that point in time um therefore it kills their dream off and therefore they, they forget about doing it and again you get this all the time as well richard i wish i'd bought property all these years ago yeah. many people actually say that yeah. property in the last 50 years have gone up eight thousand percent in the last 50 years do you think your granny and granddad would have thought would have would have said i wish i'd bought property absolutely yeah, definitely. <laughs> and and where would you be now if they had done that and they had done it properly and they would passed it on to you to help you out as well and all your family as well that's why the wealth creation really is so important. yeah yeah that's yeah, why the wealth creation is so important and that's why it's important that people tune in on um on the uh, uh, Monday at 12 30. Monday 12 30 we'll be talking about uh, mastering focus yeah and uh, so to round up today guys if you are thinking of selling to your tenant maybe you want to know is it the right thing to do am I going to get the best deal um, or maybe you just like some extra support and getting the sale through then of course we would uh, be more than happy to discuss things further uh, my direct mobile number and email is in the link attached as always so feel free to reach out to me all right, thanks everybody for joining in today. Rosalind, you jumped in to say morning, morning Angela. So thanks guys. Sometimes when we we get so involved in what we're talking Angela's about. on both. Angela's on TikTok it's and she's TikTok also on well. she's also on social media. She must be watching us on two different channels at the same <laughs> yeah, time. Uh, that, Angela, Trucker Lad has been communicating me all the way through this. Thanks yeah. very much for the congratulations of buying the fair properties, Trucker Lad. Um yes, we do sell land, just so you understand that. Yeah. If you want to fire me your details, um, direct on message on TikTok because you can message on TikTok direct us. Fire your details and uh, we can we can have a conversation if that's the case. Good. Right, we'll leave it there today, and uh, that was really good, Jim. Thanks for that, and thanks everybody for watching, and we will catch you all on Monday at twelve thirty. Bye for now. Bye. See you later.